Okay, very good. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to our virtual hike. This is the uh, second one actually that we've done on Zoom and uh, the uh, uh, experience is, is a little bit surreal, but uh, hopefully this, this will be fun. Um, the, uh, the hike that we have here is, is on the, the rotary trail. Let me, let me put up the, um, ah, there's Eddie, perfect. There's Eddie. All right. All right, timing is perfect. So let me get our, uh, our screen up here and then uh, we'll get started. So everyone should be seeing the, the screen at this point. And uh, uh, if, there's no, if there's anyone who's having trouble seeing the screen, you can, uh, uh, you can let me know in, uh, by speaking up. That would probably be the easiest way because then I would hear you. Uh, or, or sending me a chat, which I will probably be able to, to pick up on. Um, so, let's get started. Okay. I am Barbara Lass. Uh, and I'm Wade Huntley. Um, so just before we start the meeting, I, I just wanted to let everybody, let everybody know that if you have any questions along the way, uh, what I, because we have three different um, guests coming in to make presentations as well, what I'd like people to do is put their questions into the chat space. And then at the end of the hike, I will go back and, and uh, uh, read through those questions in the order in which they were um, submitted. And that way, uh, we will we'll be able to get through uh, the entire hike in, in, in a kind of a succinct amount of time and have, have, a, have a full um, opportunity for discussing all of the different um, elements of the, of, the, uh, of the signs and of the, of the presentations that we have along the way. As, as you may know, um, what we're going to do here is, is look at each sign on the rotary trail but we have three different guests uh, who are, who in a sense, we're gonna stop and listen to what they have to say at the appropriate sign. So uh, that's more or less our plan. Uh, and uh, uh, here we go. Well, before we actually walk out on the trail, I just wanna talk a little bit about what the Rotary Trail is and about the uh, role of the Rotary Club in it. Um, as Dave mentioned, um, this project was started back in 2017 and Trekkers was one of several local groups that was asked to propose a project for the El Cerrito Rotary Club. And Trekkers proposed a nature trail in the hillside natural area and our project was chosen. We worked closely with the Rotary Club. Um, their members did much of the work on the, the trail. The funding came from the regional Rotary Club, this local club, the club, some from Trekkers, but most of the funding came from the Rotary Club. So thank you to Lee Crutton and the El Cerrito Rotary Club, without whom this, this great trail would not be possible. And now we're going to set out walking on the trail. <laughs> okay. So our, uh, our first sign is actually the, uh, the birth of the hillside. And it begins, uh, this sign is, is at the beginning of the trail on the south end of the trail. Uh, we're gonna go from the south and head north, which is more or less the order in which the signs are, are, are placed as well. Um, and this first sign, the Birthday Hill side offers, as you can see, great view of El Cerrito in the foreground and of Albany Hill in the background. So you access this from what, Memorial Grove from Schmidt? You can. Um, yeah. Yes, you can do it from Schmidt or you can do it from the top. And that would be, what is the name of that court? King, King Court. King Court? Yeah. 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 Okay, go ahead. What's the next one? Oh. So the hillside area, as most of you know, is a great open space for El Cerrito. It's about 100 acres um, large. And as Pam uh, mentioned earlier, please check out our great new trail map, which shows you all of the trails for hiking in um, the hillside area, not just this work trail, but, but others. You can um, order the map from Pam at Trekkers, or you can buy it at the Jenny K store on Stockton Avenue. So our next sign is about invasive plants in the hillside. And as you can see, this sign offers a view of the hillside. Uh, it's actually kind of an open view, so you can get a good view of all the both native and invasive plants um, that we have to offer in, in, the, in the area. So invasive plants are, of course, non-native plants that spread quickly, they invade. 
And um, they're a problem, not just because they crowd out uh, native vegetation, because they're often fuel for fires. Uh, Trekkers has occasional broom pulls in the hillside area, so watch for some publicity about that. Um, that's groups of people who get together and volunteer to pull out um, one of the um, invasive plants shown on this sign, which is the French broom. So our next sign is the first of two geology signs. Now this sign also, as you can see, offers a great view of El Cerrito and the Bay, the Golden Gate, and San Francisco. Um, to talk about geology on both of the signs, we're happy to have uh, Gary Prost. And so at this point, I'll turn it over to Gary. Great. Can you hear me all right? Uh, yes. OK, good. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. This looks like a good day to be doing a virtual walk. I'm Gary Prost. I'm a retired geologist. I was warned to keep this under five minutes, so if you want to know more about me or see a detailed version of this geology walk, you can go to my website, GaryProstGeology.com. Um, I want to thank Trail Trekkers and Rotary Club for putting these signs together and give a shout out to my son Adam, who drew up many of the signs. I'm going to go to the next slide. So the point of this first sign is that we're standing here in the East Bay Hills on ancient seafloor that originated far west of here out in the Pacific and slowly moved east on the tectonic plate until it came into contact with the North American plate. You want to go to the next slide? So this diagram shows how the East Bay Hills, which is the red star, uh, consists of sediments and seafloor that was scraped off the Farallon Plate as it plunged under the North American Plate. Try thinking of a, of a three-topping pizza that you're sliding under a door. <laughs> That'll give you the picture. This was, this, the sediments and seafloor was scraped off by thrust faults and then pushed back up into the west. Uh, these are no nearly horizontal faults that put older rocks on top of younger rocks. Next slide. So this, this slide occurs further along the trail. Um, it shows sandstones and shales, a mashup of sediments and seafloor material that's all together called the Franciscan terrain. And it dates back some 200 million years, back to the Jurassic, the time of the dinosaurs. Layers of sand and mud have been metamorphosed or changed into what geologists here call a gray wacky sandstone. It's basically a dirty sandstone. We can look at metamorphic minerals like glaucophane, which is the, the, what gives blue schist its color, its bluish color. These can only form at depths between 9 and 18 miles and at temperatures between 400 and 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So we know that these rocks had been buried deeply at one time. Next slide. So we know the blue schist was originally a basalt. It's a black lava that forms most of the ocean floor and erupts at seafloor spreading centers like the East Pacific Rise. When we look at the, the gray wacky sandstone, we can see relic bedding and we can look at the grains and we can tell that it was deposited as submarine landslide deposits that moved sand from near shore environment into deep water. So it's basically all I wanted to say, the outcrops of these rocks are scattered throughout the park. And you can see them in the fire roads as well, in the, in the bed of the fire roads. Why don't you see if you can find them and identify them next time you're out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. And as I mentioned, um, if you've got questions for Gary, please put them in the chat space. And we'll be happy to take those uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the hike. So next is our sign uh, on Oak Groves. Um, this sign appears on the trail heading into a more wooded area of the trail, uh, heading into one of the creek beds, um, and it's positioned really conveniently right next to a beautiful grove of oaks. 
So um, live oaks, as you see here on the sign, are fire resistant. And part of what makes them fire resistant is that they have these sort of leathery evergreen leaves. They have thick bark and they can sprout to reproduce themselves. So all of these things help them with uh, fire resistance. So heading into this creek valley, and this is a view heading, looking back to the west, um, it, you'll encounter our sign on coyotes. Uh, this is the view uh, to the west, as I mentioned, and, um, and the first of our signs on animals in the, in the, in the uh, natural area. So sadly, unfortunately, the coyote sign was recently knocked down by vandals and is not there right now but we do have the sign and it will be reinstalled soon. So if you go out tomorrow, you won't see the coyote sign, but it will be returning. So you still have the sign? Yes. It was just knocked down, okay. Right. So the next sign that you encounter is actually at the creek that makes up this, this small little creek valley. Um, and uh, you can see here looking up hill, the, the creek bed, of course, uh, we were there out there in November uh, this was actually Thanksgiving Day, I think, right? And so uh, uh, the creek was dry at that point, um, but uh, maybe today it's got a, a little bit more in it. And maybe if you go out on Wednesday when it's supposed to pour, uh, you'll see a pretty active creek here. So there are many of these small creeks in the East Bay, and typically they start up in the hills and they come in sort of a fan-like formation down into larger and larger creeks and then eventually go down into the bay. There are several of these creeks in El Cerrito and Albany that actually come together down in the Creekside Park near Albany Hill. And that area was originally a marsh, um, sort of a coastal wetland, and all of these creeks came together there. So eventually this creek in the hillside area would have, or probably still does, flow into that area. Coming out of the creek bed is this sign about shrubbery in the hillside area, and it is placed next to a really good example of some shrubbery. Now, one of the common shrubs, as the sign points out, is the sticky monkey flower shown on the bottom there. The monkey flower shrub can actually get three to four feet um, tall, and the flowers attract bees and hummingbirds, so it's a really important part of the habitat. This sign about the hawks is nicely placed ne next to a uh, sloping grassland where you might easily find some of the hawks soaring. So this is the hawk sign, and at this point, I'd like to introduce Tara, uh, excuse me, Tara McIntyre, who's going to tell us more about hawks, and she's also going to talk a bit about towhees, um, a sign about birds that's found a little further along the trail. Right, as my laptop just about fell onto my lap, um, <laughs> <laughs> and like just came tipping for me forward. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. I, I was really excited. It's such a rainy day because everybody would come out and be on this virtual hike. So this is really exciting. Um, you can go to the next next slide. Um, maybe, you know, let's just stop there for a second. Um, so first, uh, I am a landscape architect by day, but really I'm a birder at heart and um, a volunteer with Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, um, Golden Gate Audubon, Feminist Bird Club, and I've been uh, thrilled to be able to lead hikes in the past for the Hillside uh, Festival, which I can't wait when we can do that again. So I was up there scrambling around uh, the other day. I was trying to find, I was like, oh, I want to get a better photo for the presentation. And I came across this graffiti. I, I'm not condoning it. I just, it touched me so because I know there's another smaller one. And I didn't notice this one because I had taken a different um, route and was trying to get away from people. And I just, it just, I thought this was so wonderful that it, it just shows like people notice the, the hawks up there and I think many people uh, notice them too or they don't necessarily know that it's a red tail hawk. And so to me, this is a red tail hawk because of the identification features, which we'll cover here in a second. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So red tail hawks. First question you always ask yourself, why isn't it a red tail when you see this big thing floating around up in the air or you see a big lump in the tree? Um, and that's really how you describe them. Like when somebody says to me, like, I saw this big thing in a tree. And I was like, well, most likely it was a red tail. And then you start working through the, the other um, identification and, and field markings. And so that's a up close and personal uh, view on the left. And that's from uh, Golden Gate. 
Raptor Observatory, and um, and that photo on the on the right is a quintessential red-tailed adult, and we'll go through that in the next couple slides. You can go to the next slide. So red-tailed hawks, like I said, they are, you know, it's like, why isn't a red tail? Well, why isn't a red tail? Because they're the most common raptor in North America. And you can see that from the, the distribution map um, on the left. And, you know, just to kind of few fun facts, because there's, I could talk for an hour on them. Um, females are larger than males. And that's typical in all raptors. So that's pretty cool. Um, no offense to anyone, but that's, that's uh, something that makes them unique. Uh, they are often these sit and perch birds. They sit up in the eucalyptus or you'll see them over by the power line cut. Um, they just sit. They're very, um, this is why they're so successful because they don't expend a lot of energy. They're very focused on what they're looking for and they love mammals and they love snakes um, and they will take birds as well. They typically are mated pairs um, they're, um, like a lot of birds and a lot of raptors and this this one's always fun when people hear in the movies they see the bald eagle fly overhead and they hear the scream it's not a bald eagle they're the most unmelodious birds on the planet for you know calls but uh that's a red tail that's the voiceover so um they're quite famous in that respect you can go to the next slide uh red tails are not always red uh, the adult on the left is what they molt into, so they lose their feathers after their first year completely. And so the tail on the right is a juvenile. So when somebody says, it didn't have a red tail, it's not a red tail. Well, that's not the field mark. I mean, it, it is when it's an adult, but there are other marks. So just, you could always, these are great like tidbits you could use at a cocktail party, you know, when we can have those again. Um, so put those in your back pocket. You can go to the next one. So again, here's, here's, they have a wide variety of uh, plumage too. So on the left is the adult, on the right is a juvenile. Um, the telltale field mark is the, it's called the batagial mark, which is kind of on the leading edge. You can see sort of like right where their, um, where your elbow would be is sort of uh, on a bird wing, it's a batagial mark. And that is one of the field marks that is throughout, but they can be chocolate brown. They can be completely all brown, they can be very white, so there's lots of morphs in their wing, in their coloration. You can go to the next slide. Uh, and then the exciting part about the hillside is we have red tails that nest, and we have fledged, and they fledge young so far that I've been witnessing for the past, past few years, been very successful. Typically two, I've seen three, um, and it's about a two to three month process um, from, and they're, they're already up in the air. You'll probably notice them, you know, they're talon dropping and they're chasing each other around and they're getting ready to, you know, start mating. And, and so hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have a, another fledged uh, um, nest this, this spring. And just so you know, never point out nests to anybody. Keep those quiet. Um, go to the next, next slide. Uh, and then even more exciting, our hawks are banded. One of them, and you can see uh, in the photo on the right, there's a federal band on its, on its uh, tarsus, on its leg. And it, it actually has a, a, a vole or a, a, some rodent in its talons. Uh, and you can see the, the band too on the left, that's a, another um, red tail that we banded, but uh, that is the band that identifies them and that data can be used in migration studies. And you can go to the next. I'm using some of my time for the uh, TOEI slides. Oh, um, no. it's, 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 okay. <laughs> I'm like watching my little clock go and I'm like, oh no. Um, and uh, so if anybody has any questions about red tails, you can, I'm uh, happy to answer those at the end. And then spotted TOEI. So this is, they're just the cutest, most adorable birds. And I, um, uh, I picked these when, when Dave asked, you know, hey, we need, you know, wondered if you'd like to select some birds and it was like red tail without question it was spotted towie and spotted towies are these uh they're passerine birds so they're songbird and they you can go to the next slide we'll get a, a nice photo there we go that's what they really look like and they have this beautiful red eye um they're typically on the ground sometimes if they hear you walking by they'll pop up on top of like a coyote bush or wherever they are because they're usually on the ground and they're they scratch so they scratch at the ground to uh uncover under the leaves like bugs and insects and and things and seeds and uh so so you'll hear them before you see them 
um, they're very vocal. And again, they'll usually hide in the, they'll vocalize, but you won't see them. And then sometimes you can, they'll peek out. Um, but keep your eye open for these because they're just beautiful, beautiful, and that beautiful red eye. They're just really stunning. Um, and then 90 species, and I know there's more. In fact, I just looked at the list and I was like, oh my gosh, on eBird. And I was like, there's birds missing. So it is well over 90 species that are documented. And, you know, and for raptors, I, was, I was wanted to also say, you know, there's turkey vultures and great horned owls up there and red shoulders and white-tailed kites. And there's a kestrel who's been hanging out recently on Motorcycle Hill. Um, so there's just, there's just a lot of life up there and it's really exciting. So you can go to the last slide. And so what I, I have to plug this because what can we do? Because it's really wonderful to have in such an urban area. And I know we've got wildcat over the, the hillside, but you know, this is a really special place. And so, Take, take, you know, take care when you're um, taking care of your garden and, and your yard and really don't use rodenticides. Um, they have a huge impact on, on so many animals, especially raptors. Um, rats, raptors as a solution, I invite you to go visit their website. Local folks started that nonprofit. Avoid insecticide, herbicides, definitely don't use Roundup. And then give birds space, observe them, enjoy them. They are wonderful things. Uh, and, and you can bird anywhere from the tarmac at the airport um, to the, the grocery parking lot, anywhere. So share your knowledge and thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tara. We're really uh, captivated by the, by the images. And, and uh, as with, uh, with Gary, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat space. We'll come back to those at the end of the, at the, end of the hike. And uh, uh, I know I've got a couple of questions, so I'll look forward to that. So our, our hike continues uh, along that same uh, grassland. Uh, here a little bit further is a sign on the grasslands and about the wildflowers that often appear here. So there are actually um, at least 80 native plants in the natural area. Uh, many of them flower, as this sign points out. And the best time for flowers in the hillside natural area is April and May after the winter rain. So I hope everybody can get up there this spring and look for some of the flowers. This sign is about the Huchian, the native peoples who populated this area. Uh, it describes them and, uh, and it, and it uh, at least leads me to imagine uh, what this area might have been like when, when these folks were, were roaming under these oak trees. So this was just one of many groups of Native Americans in the Bay Area that are sometimes called collectively the Ohlone. And um, the Ohlone are the same people who lived at the Shell Mound sites that you might have heard about that um, were in Emeryville and, and West Berkeley. This fly, the, excuse me, this uh, sign on the damselfly is in the second uh, creek bed, creek, little creek valley that, that you encounter along this trail. Um, and uh, is, is located uh, next to that creek bed looking up to the east as, uh, as, was, the, as was the other creek bed sign. Uh, I want to apologize for not having my video working. I can't seem to get it going. I'm Eddie Dunbar with the Insect Sciences Museum, and I also work for the City of Oakland Public Works, so I have a lot of experience with infrastructure. Um, the slide that we're looking at is, is on the trail, uh, and it is an exclamation damselfly. Now, damselflies are, are related to dragonflies. They're smaller and thinner. Um, that's a damsel versus a dragon. And the wings are held over the back. Um, and the, um, the wings for a dragonfly are held outstretched. So there's a difference between the damselflies and the, dams and the dragonflies. Both of them are aerial predators. They, they fly and they look for insects that they can eat. Those are gonna be tiny flies, uh, flying aphids, small insects. But they're also known to pluck spiders out of their spider webs. So um, yeah, they are pretty good predators. Um, it's said that a adult dragonfly can eat as many as 500 mosquitoes in a day. Um, so they are voracious predators. They tend to be around streams and, and waterways, but they may travel many miles inland. Uh, they don't need to be near water um, as they're foraging. Um, the exclamation damsel is a little bit different. If we look at slide two, um, you're going to see uh, some of the behavior 
oh, oh actually, this is for recognition. Um, so look on the pronotum uh, behind the head. You're going to have uh, something that looks like an exclamation part, uh, mark. But if you turn this picture 90 degrees, maybe 180 degrees, uh, you'd see that dot and then the, the bigger mark at the top. That's on the pronotum of the damselfly, and that's what we use to, to recognize this damselfly. In addition to this color, it's got a really vibrant blue, uh, turquoise. And the females are also this color, but they can also be a drab gray or brown. Um, and then if we look at the next slide, this is what's called a mating wheel. Um, so when dragonflies mate, the, the male grabs the female by the back of the head. And she, uh, by instinct, will move her abdomen to underneath the beginning of his abdomen. And that's where he has his sperm packet. So that's how mating occurs. And these are called wheels or they're called uh, 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 dragon, dragon wheels. Um, and this is characteristically how they mate. And then after she's done collecting the sperm, he'll guide her around. I, I, I tried not to say he drags her around, but he guides her around and then shows her different places where he thinks it's a good idea for her to lay her eggs. And what she'll often do is uh, use her ovipositor and she'll lay the egg, she'll create a slit in the plant, uh, water-based water, water -based plants, and she'll lay her eggs inside of those plants. Um, those eggs don't hatch until, uh, well, those don't become adults until the next uh, spring. Um, let's see, so again, they may travel some distance in um, from the water, but exclamation damsels, the photographs that I've always seen for these are always near, they're always on, pretty much always on plants. And those are gonna be the plants that are near the water. Um, they are highly dependent. This is a specialist damselfly. You have generalists and specialists. Generalists can live anywhere. They can eat you know, a wide variety of things. But the specialists are more dependent on the ecology. So where the waterways dry up for, uh, in, you know, in the dry seasons, these damselflies don't inhabit those waterways. Um, they prefer to be in areas where the water is, is, is running all year long. So let's look at the next slide and you're gonna see some areas at the top of the screen. There's some dark, I can't use my mouse, but there are some dark uh, horizontal lines where the vegetation seems kind of thick. Um, um, and you'll see shadows. Those are two of the creeks that are, are north of the hillside area. And it, the, uh, you'll see some arrows popping up on the left side. Um, so those are where we would likely find the, the damselfly. But then you're also finding them in Tilden Park. Uh, up on the Wildcat Creek area, you'll have some up there. There are two records up there. Uh, and then the, the photograph or the insert at the bottom right, um, where the lights, the lines on the topo map are really dense. Um, that's encircling the recycling center. So um, to the right, you can see some waterways that are not covered up. Those are the blue squiggly lines. And then on the left side, there's some more blue squiggly lines, which are more waterways that are uncovered. Being in public works and working with our drainage department, our parks department, our trees department, um, I know that um, there are groups who want to do more daylighting. Uh, daylighting is where you take an existing a waterway that's covered with maybe a pipe or a culvert and you open that up and that's some of the stuff that we've been doing in the city of Oakland is opening up these waterways so that the um, the inhabitants the, the, nat the natural species can actually um, recolonize those areas and that's one of the things I'm glad that Sue Schwartz is working on in this area and, and actually Sue is who got me involved in, uh, in El Cerrito in Albany um, the next slide is showing how this uh, area, the natural area, is encircled by some waterways. And there's some other adjacent waterways. Um, but it's a good opportunity to get this damselfly, which is a rare damselfly. I mean, it's not on any species list um, that I know of, but it's one that's not commonly encountered, as opposed to another damselfly, which is called the um, the what is it? The Vivid Dancer. Vivid Dancer, when you go outside and you see a damselfly, that's going to be the one you see probably 98 out of 100 times. 
Um, but this damselfly is a good candidate for having habitat restored. Well, thanks very much, Eddie. It's uh, uh, a, a brilliant look into, into uh, I didn't know that, uh, that it was quite that rare. So now I know if I ever have a chance to actually spot one of these, it's going to be a real privilege. And you're going to look at that pronotum to see if you see that exclamation point. That's, your, <laughs> that's, yeah. perfect. that's a great insight. Um, yeah. So, and again, uh, if you have any questions, please put those into the chat space and uh, we'll come back and, and, and get to those at the end. So our next sign here is about mountain lions. It's the, it's the other one of the, the two signs about wildlife in the area. Um, and uh, this one talks about uh, uh, mountain lions, which can still be found in this area. In fact, uh, even more so, right? Uh, yes. The, as you probably know from reading uh, things in the news lately, mountain lions are becoming more common in urban areas rather than less, at least more commonly seen. And they often are found where there are deer because that's the main thing that they prey on. So where there are deer, there, there can be and often are um, mountain lions. This sign is about banana slugs. I think maybe it's one of my favorite signs in the whole park. Um, it's, it's the last sign on our hike. It's not the last sign on the trail, but we've covered a couple of other signs earlier um, uh, on the geology and on, and on the, uh, and on the uh, birds. And so, uh, so this will be the last sign of the hike. This is uh, looking back um, in the direction from which you would have come if you've gone from south to north as we have in this hike. And um, Barbara? Uh, we actually saw Wade and I a nice um, banana slug here maybe That's right. some years ago, That's right, right. not far from the sign actually. That's right. Um, there are several species of banana slugs found on the forest floor of the west coast of the U.S. And um, I didn't realize until I was getting ready for this presentation that the banana slug is the second largest land slug, terrestrial slug in the world. They can get up to 10 inches long. And in case you're wondering, maybe not at this point in the presentation, but in case you're wondering, I was curious about the largest slug, and that is actually a European slug that is 12 inches long. Mm. So the banana slug is close to that at up to 10 inches. <laughs> and any of you who are alumni of Santa, Santa, Santa Cruz, uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, go slugs. Uh, all right, so uh, that's the end of our hike. And uh, this is not at, actually at the end of the hike. This is from the overlook uh, over the, uh, the recycling center that uh, Eddie mentioned on his uh, topo map. You could you saw the, the sort of the cliff face. So this is at the top of that, uh, looking out at the bay. Um, uh, most of you have probably uh, been there and, and know this view. So um, if you are uh, not members or, uh, or and would like to be one, or if you are otherwise interested in things that, that we're doing, the uh, website is listed up here on the image. And um... yes, well, thank you for coming. Thank you very much to our presenters, Tara, Eddie, and Gary. If there's any questions for the presenters or anyone else um, here, please um, uh, send us up. Please ask. Please ask. If you That's haven't right. already done so in the chat space, and um, we're opening it to questions now. Yeah, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna take the, the screen down so that we'll have the the, the full uh, um, discussion and. Uh, uh, I did find a few uh, questions earlier. I haven't been tracking it completely, but I know going back um, to Gary, uh, there, there were a couple of uh, questions uh, all at the same time. Are you still there, Gary? I sure am. Okay. Um, it, up at about 426, if you see the timestamps on the, on yeah. the, the uh, chat, there's actually uh, three of them for you there. Um, what was the primary rock in the quarry? One about sandstone and, um, and about tours. Right, so the primary rock being mined in the quarry was the gray wacky sandstone, it's slightly metamorphosed sandstone. It was being used for foundation work, road metal, other aggregates, basically. Um, next question, is the sandstone at the hillside the same as other sandstone in the Bay Area, like at Castle Rock, for example? And the answer is yes. Um, Another good place to see it is Albany Hill. That is basically cored by the same sandstone. I got a, another question here. Is Marietta Rock at Arlington and Cutting an example of blue schist? And the answer is yes. Um, there are several examples you can see uh, underneath the power line along uh, Moser. And as you walk along um, Arlington, that's where it seems to outcrop the best. Uh, 
Do I ever offer geology tours of the Hillside Natural Area? I think Dave answered that in the comments. The answer is yes. Uh, I've done a several times, two or three times, with the trail trekkers, along with the um, other geologists from the Northern California uh, Geological Society. So yeah. And I noticed, uh, kind of moving on to some of the next questions, uh, Dave already answered the TAR also gives some bird walks in the, uh, in, in the area. Uh, and I got a question here from Claire uh, to Tara that uh, uh, it's about 4.33 in the chat space. A red-tailed hawk crashed into our 10-foot living room picture window. Stayed on the ground days for a few minutes. What can I do to prevent this from happening again? Yeah, so that's very common. Um, and of course, I'm like, are you sure it was? So the red tails, um, I bet it, and if you have a photo, I would love to see, but um, often this happens with Cooper's hawks and exhibitors because they get so fixated that they're chasing a bird through the uh, bushes and they just will slam into windows. So typically um, uh, when those bird strikes with the bigger raptor, nine times out of 10, it's an exhibitor. Um, but that's not always, you know, that's the nine times out of 10. Um, Birds see the reflection and they think it's a forest too. And so um, there are lots of different, there's lots of new technology. I know Audubon has been working with American Bird Conservancy um, to create new glass and there's a lot of in buildings for lead and things like that. Uh, certification, you have to include glass, um, new different types of glass, but you can do tape and I'll, I'm looking for the, I'm trying to get the link. I'll paste it in the chat as we move on. But there's lots of resources out there. You can there's cool patterns or something you can apply to the glass uh, to help break up the reflection, and that will help with not just raptors chasing birds, but other um, songbirds too. Great. And the other question I see here for you is uh, uh, at 4:35 in the chat space. I see hawks being harassed by crows. Does it really matter to them? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're an annoyance. I mean, a big red tail is like, doesn't care, but I, we do have a bunch of crows up on the hillside and I, you saw the photo, they do harass them for sure. Um, they're an annoyance. Where they're really uh, impactful is when uh, there's a, a nest. Uh, that's why it's always, you, know, you never want to point at a nest or uh, something because uh, corvids, are, which is crows and, and, and ravens are super smart and they will watch you and they will see where you're pointing and they will go and predate nests. And so they could easily get into the red tails nest and, uh, and knock out a fledgling and, and kill it. So um, crows are they're amazing birds, but yeah, they, they can have an impact on them for sure and other birds. Um, I saw another, there were a couple of questions. I'll just grab them right now. Turkey yeah, vulture, okay. red tail hawk. Somebody had a question of that. Red tail hawks are typically, most raptors fly with their wings out flat and straight. Um, and there's some other field marks, but if you see a turkey vulture, hold your, they call it a dihedral. So you hold your arms up in like a V and then wobble. And that's a turkey <laughs> vulture. So, um, that that's kind of a quick and dirty i mean i we all like my birder friends were always like is that a turkey vulture or a red tail you know like it's just lighting it's always really hard but shape you can do it on shape talon dropping talon dropping is where you'll see them like holding their legs straight down and usually their wings are up and they're like there's usually another bird around and they're calling and it's a courtship display uh they don't know necessarily what it means it's just usually associated with courtship uh behavior and then I think there was, I think that was, those are the only ones. So yeah, thank you for all these questions. Those are great. Could I ask a bird question? As yeah. Long as we're right here. Um, it'll be, it'll be quick. Um, the hawks that you see swooping low through the backyard, chasing birds away from the bird feeder and such, are those Cooper's hawks probably? Yeah, we have Cooper's, so Cooper's hawks and, and uh, sharp shinned hawks. Um, and so in the air, they are, I swear, if you were standing next to uh, something that they were locked on, like they're, they may see something they want, they, they will lock on and they will take it out right next to you. They, and if it was sitting on your shoulder, they will, and they want it. They are the most fierce little hawks and that, and they're woodland hawks. So they're really short, fat wings so they can navigate through your yard and through the bushes. And they love to um, sit by your bird. If you feed the birds, they will sit and just wait. They are like, they will decimate a bird feeder um, in no time. 
the tweezers yeah. or the sharp shins? Both of them. Both of, Both of them. them. Sharpies are probably worse because they're smaller and um, and you know, Cooper's hawks are the females are pretty big. They're pretty beefy hawks, but they'll you know they're yeah they're they're killing machines. I won't sugarcoat it. <laughs> but, but that's what they do. I mean, that's part of the circle of life, right? Is that uh, is that the one we just answered here? Uh, how do you identify Cooper's hawk versus a red? I think that person asking about how to identify them. Oh. I just asked where you found them. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a topic. Cooper's hawk and and, and red tails. It's um they're very different in habitat. They're they're um they're uh, red tails tend to have like a different breast pattern. Um, it also depends if it's a juvenile or an adult. Um, size difference. Uh, I, I like to think of um, exhibitors in general, especially Cooper socks, they just look mad. They're just angry and they, they have a crest that sort of sticks up and they have a, and they have a dark cap. Uh, their eye colors are usually different. Again, they all, juveniles and adult birds have different plumages. So now you have four different birds that look different. And so it's not easy. I, I would invite all about birds, Cornell's website, is fantastic to help kind of uh, work through what you think you saw and like and start comparing. Okay, um, in the in the chat, I saw one uh, comment more than a more than a question on the uh, on the damselflies that uh, that um, uh, talked about how they there's also a valuable um, ex exclamation damselfly territory in the Fairview open space. Dave mentioned, and uh, I was wondering if um, Eddie, you have any comment on that? I don't. I don't know the uh, Fairview Open Space. Bear with me, sorry. There is a creek there in the Fairview Open Space. A couple of them. There's yeah. A couple of them, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah if I could find out where that is, I could go and take some pictures and look around. Looking at the map you showed, it looked like there were two creeks. It's the Fairview Open Space is the area that looks like it's part of the hillside natural area, but it's privately owned, and it's the northern extension of it. So okay. where Tamil Pius and Fairview Streets come together, there is a little trail that goes in there. Um, so it's bordered by that area and by the houses along the Arnold. Okay, you said Tamil Pius and where else? Well, where Tamil Pius and Fairview Streets come together in a kind of V. There's a trail okay. that goes in to the um, Fairview open space where a developer has proposed building a bunch of houses. And it's, it's a hillside and there's one creek right at the very, um, I guess it's the western edge, and then there's a series of cascades that runs down on the other side. So there's two significant creeks there. Okay, all right. You can, you can also access the creek uh, if you walk north of Snowden along the, the property lines there. Uh, you know, there's a fence and it's been cut. It's sort of a, an open area. If you go north of Snowden, you can run into a creek there. Okay, are you trying to make a case um, in in support of keeping that area na natural or? Um... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So um, there's one other question that I've spotted in the in the chat that's not really addressed to anybody in particular. I don't know who's the expert, but it says, "Are banana slugs eaten by any animals in the hillside area?" Um, which is shockingly sad to me because I love the banana slugs. But uh, does anybody know the answer to that question? <laughs> well, I'm the banana slug expert in the room. That was the only trail sign that we didn't get a real expert to write. And so I got two books about slugs out of the UC library and I wrote it. But my knowledge of banana slugs is confined to what it says on the sign. I don't, I don't really know who eats them. <laughs> I bet you somebody eats them. I bet you those Coyotes will eat a banana slug. Yeah, a lot of slugs I I know are um, are poisonous, so you might get a buzz uh, eating a banana slug. I wouldn't recommend it. Well, that actually, um, Dave, your your comment about doing the banana slug slime gives me a chance to to go back and make sure we we uh, comment on one of your posts in the chat, which is to thank um, Adam Pross for volunteering to do most of the illustrations. Um, and to uh, all of those who contributed um, art and and text for for the signs, including Tara and Gary, who are with us today, um, who and, helped, Eddie. and Eddie, who also contributed uh, to the, all three of them contributed text to these signs, and so um, that gives me a chance to make sure that that we uh, 
um, that we give those thanks in front of everyone. Are there You're other welcome. questions for our guests or anyone else? Can I ask a bug question? Please ask a bug question. Um, this is not related to damselflies, but um, a few years ago, Wade and I were walking in the hillside. I don't think it was the Rotary Trail. I think it was a different trail. We crossed a creek where there's a little bridge near the north end of the park. And this was in the late summer. And some kind of insects that were flying and violent came out of a hole in the ground and attacked us. And they stung our head and our okay. face, and um, it was really unpleasant. And we ran out of the. They were really quite small. Right? I, they were not very big, but they were very painful. Yeah. And we ran out of the park so fast. I don't remember running down the trail, and um, <laughs> never found out what they were. Those are yellow jackets. I don't remember which species it is, but there is a sub. There's only one subterranean yellow jacket in this area. Um, I just don't remember its name. Is it a type what, of a wasp? Yeah, yellow jackets are wasps. They're also okay. often confused for bees. And people will report being stung by bees when it's actually yellow jackets. The difference between yellow jackets and typical wasps is they don't have a thin waist. Their abdomen connects broadly to the thorax. So yeah, they we look were like... not looking at their waist. We were... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were looking at our feet rapidly moving <laughs> along the trail. Yeah. Yellow jackets for sure. <laughs> okay. So I have a question for Tara, if you, if, uh, if you don't mind. Um, it's a pretty simple one. Those, the images that you sent us for the slideshow, did you take those yourself? Yes. Because I saw your name on them. Uh, and you took the, did you take those all in the natural area? I try most of those. Yeah, I think with the exception of the one with the face shot, uh, okay. those were all taken in the hillside area. Okay. Yeah, yeah. those are uh, oh, except for oh, yeah, they're, they're all like right here. But yes, yeah. Well, they're fantastic images, and and it really encourages me to look for the for the hawks up there now because mostly what we've seen are the vultures, and so so uh, I didn't realize are they how commonly would wouldn't see them if if you're looking for them every day and and look if you want to if you want to see them go over by the the quarry they like to hang out they they like to so that quarry allows for some good ridge lift sure. you know the and and they love to red tails are lazy if you want to like live a nice good life pretend to be a red tail they got it they know how to do it and so well, maybe, they love maybe it's my own problem because I am actually a bit colorblind. I don't see red very well. So maybe I have actually seen them and didn't even realize. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, you won't see the tail oftentimes. And then if it's, the lighting is, is right, depending on where the sun is, you just don't see it. So it's really about shape and behavior. Um, and they like to sit in the, the, uh, uh, the eucalyptus and they'll just perch there. So just scan around, you'll see a lump, you know, like, and that's usually them because turkey filters don't usually hang out. And I haven't seen them perched in the hillside. They just usually fly over. Um, so does anyone else have any questions at this point? If you, um, if you want to, you can just sort of raise your hand or pop in. Um, I think I'm going to turn off the recording at this point so that we can just sort of, um, sort of morph into a more casual discussion that may or may not stay on the, on the hike itself. So, so uh, thank you all for, for attending our hike. And, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we got some good questions for our guest presenters.